Traveling back in time to when cowboys ruled the prairie. Yeehaw! When buffaloes roamed the plains. And steam trains ran America. Whoa, this is one of the hardest working steam engines still in service. They don't make them like this anymore, baby. This is living, breathing history right here today. My name is Matt Baum. Ever since I was a kid, I've been obsessed with trains. My day job, I work on a railroad in Maine. But this is my dream. To ride the biggest, fastest, most awesome trains in history. is the Union Pacific 844, the finest steam locomotive ever built. It's been pulling passengers and freight since 1944. It's the longest running steam engine in America. It takes 750 passengers on the ride of their lives. Picking them up in Denver and bringing them here to the magic city of the plains, Cheyenne, Wyoming. To see this. The biggest rodeo in the world. It's one of the most prized steam locomotive tickets. All aboard! It's a hundred mile straight run from Cheyenne down to Denver's Union Station, where they turn the train around, collect the passengers, and bring them back to Cheyenne for the rodeo. Most people think that the age of steam railroading is dead, but not here in Cheyenne. This is home to the largest working steam locomotive shop in America, the UP Steam Shop. Here, a dedicated team are busy getting the 844 ready for her big day. This gigantic locomotive needs a lot of attention. From one end to the other, it's 114 feet and it weighs over 450 tons. The same as a jumbo jet. Starting this giant locomotive is like waking a sleeping dragon. And that's something you want to do very carefully. If they heat this locomotive up too fast, the metal's gonna expand, rivets are gonna shoot out, it's gonna cause all kinds of damage. So what they do is, they take warm steam, they pump it through this hose into the boiler and warm it up slowly. It's like warming your car on a cold winter's morning, but more dangerous. The temperature of this steam is nearly 400 degrees. That's enough to melt the skin right off your face. So Ed here wants to make sure this hose is on tight. First, we fire up the steam generator. Let's go check it out. This over here is the steam generator. Right here. What it boils down to, it's just like a giant teapot. Makes steam. Once the steam is created, it goes through that white pipe over there, over to the engine. Let's make some steam. Ed, is it all right if I press the button? You bet. All right. Oh, man. If I open this valve up, the A44 is going to come to life. That pipe, see it? It's feeding the steam to our locomotive right here. And you can feel it. It's, this pipe is boiling hot. It's kind of like the first day of winter when the central heating system in your house warms up. You hear it popping and creaking. But what's going on right here is this beast is waking up. It takes skill, craftsmanship, and patience to work on these giants. The basic principles of a steam engine are simple. Fuel is burnt in the firebox to create heat. The heat turns water into steam. As the steam expands, it's forced through a series of pipes into a set of pistons. The pressure of the steam drives the pistons. That makes the wheels go around.
For the Union Pacific steam team, caring for the 844 is more than a job. It's a labor of love. She's gonna make her happy. She's a living, breathing creature. She's alive. Yeah, you gotta treat her right. The engine is ready to go out on the tracks, but because it doesn't have any fuel in it yet, it has to be pulled out of the workshop using an engine called the Yard Goat. It's only about 1,200 horsepower. Doesn't sound like much, but this baby's made to pull. We're gonna go in and hook onto the 844. We're gonna drag it out and fire it up. <laughs> And how do you feel when you bring that big beast out like that? Getting pretty used to it, but uh, still, I mean, come it's on. It's nice to get it out in the sunlight. Yeah. It doesn't really belong in a building. And there she is in all her glory out in the sunlight. It's beautiful. The 844 was originally built to run on coal, but that became too expensive. Now it runs on recycled engine oil. The oil comes in this truck right here, and it's some nasty stuff. The oil is pumped into a giant tank that sits behind the engine, called the tender. This tender can hold 6,500 gallons of oil. If you're going to do that at the gas pump, it costs you $26,000. This is the fuel hose. It's going to plug into that tank right there. Shut off and all. Okay. Bam, it's hooked up, ready to start pumping some oil. The oil comes from the truck down there. It's pumped up this hose, goes right into here and down into the tank. And you can see it in there, it's filling up. All right, show us the dipstick. Wow, look at that dipstick. Oh, wow. It's getting up there now. 75 inches it's like a dipstick for your car, except it's about eight feet long. 6,500 gallons of oil might sound like a lot, but it's a thirsty engine. For every mile, the 844 burns 15 to 25 gallons of this fuel right here. That's one of the reasons they had to get rid of these locomotives, because they're not very efficient. But filling up with fuel is only half the job. Steam locomotives need water, lots of water. If you don't have water, you don't have steam. That's the water going into this tank right here, 28,000 gallons. It's going to make the steam. To stop the engine from getting clogged with limescale, they add a special chemical to the water. Limescale is caused by a mineral called calcium carbonate. Above 70 degrees, it forms deposits that can clog the boiler pipes and cause the whole thing to explode. The 844, loaded with fuel and water, is ready to fire up. We like fire. This could be dangerous. Ed has on protective gear, could flash back, and it wouldn't be pretty. Okay, we're gonna take this oily rag here. We're gonna set it right on the firebox. We're gonna take this fusee, which is a flare, light it up, light the rag up, throw the rag into the firebox, and blam, fire. What's happening now is the oil is slowly being fed into the firebox. And it's very, very hot. It's got to be a couple of thousand degrees. My gloves feel like they're catching on fire right now. Woo! Looks kind of quiet right now. But soon, this is going to be hauling more than a half mile worth of passenger coaches behind it. It's going to be going up to 70 miles an hour. It's going to be freaking awesome, man. This is the magic city of the plains, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Over the next few days, over 300,000 people are gonna be arriving here in Cheyenne. They're coming for one thing. The biggest rodeo in the world. And a select few will be coming in on a very special train. The Union Pacific number 844. The 844 was the last steam engine to be built for the Union Pacific Railroad. 
When it left the factory in 1944, it was the pinnacle of modern engineering. The 844 was built for speed. On the flats, it could pull 26 passenger cars over 100 miles an hour. It could make the trip from Cheyenne to Salt Lake in just 10 hours. This round trip goes from the Union Pacific Yard in Cheyenne, 100 miles south to Denver, to collect 750 rail fans and bring them back to Cheyenne for the rodeo. I've always wanted to ride one of these classic steam locomotives, and now I'm going to get the chance. Before we can go anywhere, we need to get this 450-ton engine on the right track. That's where the turntable proves its worth. So they can spin the engine around, put it anywhere they want. The engine rolls up one set of tracks onto the turntable. The table spins and lines up with a new set of tracks, and the locomotive rolls off. There's been a turntable here since the 1860s. This one can hold 800 tons on it. It's powered by electricity. Back in the day, they powered it by compressed air. Even before that, they powered it with pure manpower. First, the tracks are locked. If the table moves while the engine is moving, it could derail. Locks it up. Now you can bring a locomotive off the turntable, right to this track, right there. That thing is huge. It barely fits on this turntable. Look at it. Once the engine is on the turntable, the tracks are unlocked. With the pull of a lever, a 450-ton piece of railway history spins. Spinning the 844, what an honor, man! All right, now it's facing towards Denver. Let's go get the coaches. Next, to hook the 844 onto 26 of the finest vintage rail carriages. The problem is that a lot of them are close to 60 years old. You have to be very delicate. You can't slam them around like freight cars. One mistake, and a piece of railway history could be damaged forever. This is Ed. He's the engineer. He controls this beast. All these levers. All these controls, the whistle, it's his job to drive this. He runs the locomotive. The radio communications they have on the 844 isn't something they had back in the 1940s. Then they would have used hand signals and whistles. One, two, we're standing still. Two toots, we're going ahead. Three toots, we're backing up. A succession of short toots like toot, 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 toot means get the heck off the tracks. Here comes the 844. <laughs> Sucker. Carriages are connected by a device called the coupler. When two couplers meet, they should hook up automatically. All right, we're backing up. We're going to make the hook. We don't want to make a hard one. We don't want to damage those passenger coaches. They're some of the oldest in America. The hook didn't make. Okay, that'll be good enough, and then bang into them. He's going to slam back into the hook. Nice. Right. Well, he wasn't just trying to slam. He's going to do it nice and easy. There's the hook. We made it. We're about ready to go. Denver, here we come. The noises are amazing. It's so many different sounds. There's the chuffing, the floor shaking, and there's thumping. I'm riding a living, breathing piece of history right here.
When the 844 first rolled out of the factory in the 1940s, it pulled high-speed passenger trains. But when diesel locomotives took over in the 1950s, Union Pacific decided steam engines were too expensive. In 1959, they stopped commercial steam operations altogether. The 844 was sent to Omaha to work in a yard melting snow off the tracks. By 1960, it was the only steam engine left in operation and was set aside for special occasions, like trips to the rodeo. The 844 is halfway to Denver and we change crews. Everyone wants a turn at running a piece of history. I know from running a modern diesel locomotive, it's pretty simple. You just pull the throttle out and go. Up here in the 844, it's a lot different. There's a lot more going on. All right, let's introduce you to the crew. Get Cameron over here, he's the fireman. It's his job to make the steam. Get Steve, that's the engineer. He's running the engine. The more steam the engineer uses, the more the fireman has to keep making it. If the fireman lets the fire go out, the train will literally run out of steam and grind to a halt. Cameron here decides how much oil he wants to feed to the fire. He's looking at what Steve's doing over there with the throttle. Depending on the throttle position, that's going to decide how much steam the, the engine is using. But running out of steam isn't the worst thing that can happen. The most dangerous thing that can happen on a steam locomotive is to run out of water. And the boiler in front of us is about 10 miles of pipes. There's not enough water in this, those pipes. It's going to get really, really hot. Eventually, it's going to explode. The history of steam engines is littered with boiler explosions. February 1911, Smithville, Texas. The boiler on a yard engine blew up. Four men lost their lives and 12 were injured. March 1912, San Antonio, Texas. 26 people were killed when a Southern Pacific locomotive exploded. December 1934, Fayette County, West Virginia. A locomotive hauling mine workers blew up, killing 18. It's up to the firemen to keep track of how much water is going into the boiler. Right there's the water glass. That's what the fireman has to watch to make sure there's enough water in the boiler. You see it bobbing down up in there. He's got to keep a keen eye on that. It's a very important part of his job. There's no reserve tank. If the fireman gets the water level wrong, it could be fatal. If there's not enough, the boiler's going to explode. Boom! Heading to Denver to pick up passengers and take them to the world's biggest rodeo in Cheyenne, Wyoming. By Wyoming, hello Colorado. It might look pretty, but it's one of the scariest trains to drive. We're doing 60 miles an hour and you can't see where you're going. Modern locomotives have windows at the front so the engineer and conductor can see what's up ahead. If you want to look at a signal, just look out the window. It's right there in front of you. On this locomotive, the whole locomotive is in front of you, so you've got to stick your head out that window. That's not a problem on a straight track, but on a left-hand curve, the engineer can't see anything. Steve, this is a huge locomotive. So, so how far are you, can you see ahead with this big locomotive in front of you? So if you're going around a curve, you can't see anything to the left. Steve's going to be blind if we're going around a curve this way. So if there's a red signal or another train, the engineer can't see it coming. But the fireman can. The fireman's also watching the tracks ahead, especially if they're on a curve. That's why they have to have two guys up here. But that's not the only thing about this line. Between Denver and Cheyenne, there's only one set of tracks. That means if there's another train coming, it's got to get out of the way, or these guys are going to smash into it. There's a freight train up ahead. One of us better get out of the way. It's going to get nasty. 
When a train needs to pass another train on a single track, one of them must go into a side track called the siding. It's like a passing place on a country road. We're meeting another train. He's coming in the siding here. This, the freight train is in front of us right now, clearing the main track. He's going into a siding, so he's still out there on the other end, so these guys have to slow down and let him get in the clear. The freight train's passed, and the tracks ahead are clear for a while. Here we go again. And the freight trains keep coming. They're not going to stop. They run 24-7, even if the old steam train's out here. Today, freight trains along this line carry consumer goods, but 150 years ago, they carried gold. The gold rush of 1858 turned Denver into a mecca for gold prospectors, and the town became a supply hub for the flourishing mining industry. But Denver was isolated. The wagon trains that supplied the city were easy targets for bandits and robbers. But in 1870, the railroad changed everything. This line from Cheyenne brought in essential supplies and shipped out the town's freshly minted gold. As a result, Denver's population grew from 5,000 to over 100,000 in a single generation. in Denver, but we've got a problem. This train is so long, it's like three quarters of a mile long. And look at it, it goes way down there. The engines are way up there. And that is long for a passenger train. In fact, it's too long to fit on the platform. So what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to make a split. We're gonna put the remaining cars from this track over here to this track right here. Just cut it in two. Here's how you disconnect two cars. All right, there's the, there's the cup holders right there. This is the operating lever. You pull that up, they're going to be able to disconnect. Right in the middle there, there's the air hoses. That's what connects the brake pipe. Train breaks away, it'll snap itself. Bang. This is the guy pulling the pin right here. There it is. Bang, there's the uncoupling. They're going to take this part of the train. They're going to put it on this track right here. To get it there, we need to change tracks. This junction here in the tracks, right here, that's a switch. It's a point where you can determine which track the train will go down. It's probably like my 20,000th switch right here. All right, here come our cars. This is the head end of the train. We're putting it on this track right here. Get the train on two tracks. We've got one half over there, the other half's over here, and voila, the train fits in Denver. Once this locomotive leaves Cheyenne, it's on its own, so it brings this baby with it right here. This is the Art Lockman, it's the maintenance car. It's got every possible thing that locomotive needs on board here. Let's go up inside and take a look. Wow, look at this place. Look at this wrench right here. You think that's big? You think this is a big wrench? I don't think so. I think it's the granddaddy of wrenches right here. Have you ever seen anything like this? This is insane. If something goes wrong with this train, they're not stopping at Walmart. This isn't a monkey wrench. This is a gorilla wrench. <laughs> Man, look at that thing. They've got valve oil. They have engine oil. They've got vice grips. They've got welding rods. They've got a grinder. They've got cable ties. Batteries on charge. Old rubber gloves, kind of reminds me of my old apartment. They even have a kitchen on this car. They've got a microwave, they've got any snack you can imagine here, cookies, direct TV, they've got a fridge. This is better than an episode of Crips. Here's a freezer with everything you could imagine in here. They've got this room that has poison gas. Wah, wah. Whenever a crew are working on the track, they have to make sure that another train doesn't run into them. Before they start work, they always set a blue safety flag to let everyone know they are there. The blue flag's on. That means people are gonna be working on this train. No other train's gonna be able to come onto this track. Whoa! 
work on these steam locomotives never stop. Every 100 miles or so, you have to lubricate them. These engines are labor intensive, and that's why the railroad get rid of them. I'm gonna give these guys a hand. Here's how this works. They take compressed air from this locomotive, and they power that gun right there. This is grease right here. This might look easy, but inside that gun right there, if my finger goes in there, it's gone. I'm not coming back with it. See that? All right, here we go. When it comes out like that right here, inside that main rod, see it right there? That means that we've got enough grease in there. Every 100 miles, they go through 15 pounds of this grease. All right, it's all greased up. I still have all my fingers. My gloves are nice and dirty. Time to move on. Union Pacific are constantly looking for ways to make the railways more high-tech and efficient. But some of the greatest innovations in rail technology date back to the 1800s. I'm gonna go check out one of the most amazing feats in American railroading history, and it happened right in those mountains over there. In the 1860s, a gold and silver rush swept across the Colorado Rockies, and the fastest growing mining area was 45 miles west of Denver at Georgetown. But getting the ore down the mountain by rail seemed impossible until engineers designed the Georgetown Loop. Between Georgetown and the mine at Silver Spoon, the track had to climb 850 vertical feet. The only way to do it was with a unique corkscrew design. Best way to see it is in this guy right here. This is a track car. Let's take a ride. This track car is ideal for riding steep mountain rails, and Steve runs it. And this, is, this is quite a grade, Steve. What's the, what's the percent up here? This is the steepest part of the grade right here. This is 4%. Wow. So for every 100 feet, you go up 4 feet or down 4 feet. That's huge. Most railway lines never get above a 2% grade. This is some of the steepest track in America. This is it. This is the Georgetown Loop. This is what it's all about right here. It's like in a parking garage or a spiral staircase. You go around like this, you get to the top. This is amazing. Look, you can see the track right down there. It's a little scary right now. I mean, I can feel it in my stomach. Kind of get that roller coaster feeling. At their peak, the mines this railway serviced produced over $200 million worth of silver. No matter what way you look at it, it's a lot of money. So this is why these guys were coming up here. And without the Georgetown Loop, they would have struggled to get the silver out. The rails didn't stop at the mine. They went inside as well. This is what railroading was all about for silver. They put it in this cart. This is an original cart from the 1880s. They'd load this with silver, bring it down to the train, and then they'd haul it to Denver. Let's go inside that mine and take a look. And these are the rails that they used to push the ore carts down. These rails have been here since the mine was built in the 1860s. Probably some of the oldest rail in the country right there. Wow, look at that right there. This is called dragon's blood. It's coming out from underneath the rocks here. It's actually silver oxide. This is what the miners were looking for. They knew behind these rocks was silver. Getting the silver out wasn't easy. The rocks had to be blasted with sticks of nitroglycerin. Put the sticks of nitroglycerin into these rocks. They make these blast holes. Had to be 12 inches deep. Guys could do about an inch an hour. Some sorry sap had to do this for 10 hours a day. 
Heading back to Denver, the crew of the 844 are going to have to work through the night to get the train ready for the trip to Cheyenne. It's 5 a.m. and I'm in Denver's Union Station. We're about to take 750 rail fans on a journey back in time to when steam trains ruled America. On a very special train. The Union Pacific 844. It's pulled classic passenger trains like the Los Angeles Limited and the Portland Rose. It's even worked as a freight locomotive on the transcontinental route. Today, it's going to the Wild West Rodeo in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Before we load the 750 rail fans, there's a ton of work to do. Scott here is cleaning the rods. This is very important. It's not just for the rail fans to make them look pretty. After he cleans these rods, he can do a very good inspection on them, look for any kind of cracks or any kind of stress fractures here in the rods. Little crack turns into a big crack. Eventually, it's going to break. Boom, the train derails. So this is a very important part of it right here. Hey, Scott, can I give you a hand with that? Sure can. Man, he gave that to me pretty easy, didn't he? People get all romantic about the steam era, but I'll tell you what, it was a hell of a lot of hard work. I'm glad we don't have to do this on the diesel locomotives where I work. All right, it's scrubbed up nice. Now we just have to take a rag, wipe it down, and we're going to inspect it at the same time. Right, Scott? Yes, sir. How's it looking, Scott? Everything looks good. Looks good. The engine's ready. It's time to check the carriages. Before these 22 cars can go to the rodeo, they need to be stocked. Loading the train with food is a crack team of Denver's finest caterers. Each car needs the right amount of food, cutleries, beverages, cups, silverware. If these guys mess it up, you're going to have a bunch of unhappy rail fans. 22 trash cans, 30 cases of beer, put everything right here. 60 cases of soda. 96 cases of water. Over 2,000 coffee cups. They have 2,000 wine glasses. A mine full of silverware. 250 place settings. Like that? Yes. Did I pass? <laughs> what do you give me? What do you give me for a grade? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Ouch. All right, that's it. Everything's on board. This train is stocked and loaded. It's a hundred years since Union Pacific first laid on a special train to go to the rodeo. It's a high point in Denver's social calendar. The tickets for this train sold out in three hours. But not everyone is there for the same thing. There are two types of people riding this train. First, you got your cowboys that are going to the rodeo. So if you're a cowboy, you need the hat, you need the belt buckle, a nice pair of cowboy boots. The second kind of person is a rail fan. Now, if you're a rail fan, you want to have a baseball hat, preferably with a railroad logo on it. You got to have the t-shirt with the 844, because that's the train we're riding, and the worst, most god-awful pair of sneakers you could find. Let's go find the conductor. One more time, Carol. Conductor Reed okay, Jackson Carol. has been part of the Union Pacific Steam Team for 13 years. How's it going? Good, good. All right, so what's going on here? We're getting ready for some well, action? We're about to load our passengers. We're going to release them from the station. All aboard is going aboard. All aboard! We've got 20 minutes to get this train loaded. It's turning into a madhouse up here right now. A train robber. <laughs> They've come all the way from Dallas to ride this train. We're in Denver right now. People come from Japan. They come from England. Do you think there's anybody from Maine here? One of the problems when you have a beautiful steam engine like the 844 is that everybody's down there looking at it right now. we got about 10 minutes, and they're supposed to be on the train. we got to go get them. Look at 
all the people down there looking at that train. All aboard! If you're on the train, you gotta get going. Any more for the A44? You gotta go! All aboard! All right, looks like the platform's empty. We're ready to go. Okay, you ready, Dick? Over? Yep, let's go. All right, here we go. And it's now all aboard, highball, over. I'm all 844. Over the next 100 miles, the passengers on the 844 experience one of the most amazing steam train rides. The Union Pacific 844 has left Denver's Union Station, heading north to Cheyenne. She always gets a lot of attention. This thing is like a celebrity. There's just people, throngs and throngs of people on Highway 85 out there heading north, chasing us up to Cheyenne, taking pictures, videotaping. They're in Hummers, they're in minivans, they're in Jeeps and Fords. It's like a traffic jam out there. Steve, I got a question for you. What's it like driving this celebrity? I mean, this thing is like a famous person. OK, it's hard to be humble. <laughs> <laughs> Only a handful of people in the whole country know, what, know how to do what he's doing. Pacific is the only class one railroad that maintains a steam program. Without UP, nobody would really know what went on with these steam locomotives. It would just be in history books. This is living, breathing history right here today. If anyone didn't know the 844 was coming, they would when they hear the whistle blow. The whistle plays a vital role in keeping the train and the tracks safe. Two longs are short and long. The train's coming over across. Steve, how many railroad crossings? Over 100. Over 100 railroad yeah. So you have to blow this whistle over 100 times. Yeah. Is one, is one arm developed more than the other? This looks like Popeye. This arm's like Popeye. The other one's like olive oil. Yeah. I've always wondered what it'd like to be to ride one of these steam locomotives. I've spent hundreds of hours in a diesel locomotive, and I'm loving it. Loving it. <laughs> Everyone enjoys this train. I just spooked the buffalo. I'm back in the passenger coaches. Let's go find out what the rail fans are up to. Rail fans are a strange breed. This is Boxcar Blaney. What are we gonna do today? Well, you gotta yeah, sing I us got a song? some helpers, yep. I got uh, You guys can sing? Yeah. This is Caboose, this is Flat Car, and they're gonna help me sing a song up in the next car. So we got Caboose? This is Caboose. This is Boxcar? Yeah. Flat Car. And this is Flat Car. I think you got the short end of the deal in the name, Flat Car. <laughs> 
driving six white horses when she comes. Yeehaw! She'll be driving six white horses when she comes. Yeehaw! She'll be driving six white horses. Driving six white horses. She'll be driving six white horses when she comes. Yeehaw! I'm inside the two coaches right now, right in between them, surrounded by rail fans. What they're doing is they're watching a freight train go by here. That's what we're waiting for. He's recording it on that recorder, every car that comes by. And what are you going to do with the tape after you uh, if you record it? I'm going to take it home, and on my model railroad, I'm going to listen to it as I'm running my 844 model HO gauge steam engine and the 3985 Challenger on my home layout. It's like a soundtrack, sound effects. Rail fans are just they're very passionate about this kind of stuff. If you don't know, you don't understand. I've come across three of the most dangerous rail fans in America. Look at this guy, he's packing heat. Check out these pistols. These guys are genuine sharpshooters. All right, that's my cue. I'm out of here. We're just arriving in Cheyenne. Like so many cities in America, if it wasn't for the railway, it wouldn't be here. In 1865, General Dodge was in charge of surveying a route for the Transcontinental Railroad. He faced a huge challenge, how to build a set of tracks over this range, then called the Black Hills. General Dodge found the answer, a rock formation called the Gangplank. It's a natural stone ramp that forms a steady incline over the top of the mountain. It's over 8,000 feet above sea level. It runs for 40 miles from the high plain to the top of the mountain. You can see it right here. This is the old roadbed. It's the original line that General Dodge built back in 1868. And at the foot of the mountains, General Dodge founded a town, Cheyenne. In its heyday in the 1920s and 1930s, Cheyenne was UP's busiest yard. Hundreds of steam trains passed through here every week, and it took over 5,000 workers to maintain and repair them. The Union Pacific Railroad was the biggest employer in Wyoming. But in the 1950s and 60s, diesel technology took over. Diesel engines were much easier to maintain, needed fewer workers, and cost less. The age of steam ended, but the 844 lives on. made it to Cheyenne. I've really got a new appreciation for what these steam guys go through. I had no idea. It's an amazing trip, but you know what? It's time to take off this conductor stuff and go to the rodeo. All the rest of the